this morning.
church, it is good to be with you this morning. We have gathered to do just what we've been singing, to behold our God. That's why we've come today. This is your first week here at Riverwood. We just want to welcome you. Thanks for choosing to be with us this morning. Well, as we continue this morning, we are, are going to be studying the Beatitudes again. And this morning, we look to our example first of Christ in his, in his meekness, in his strength, he leads us. And so we look to him this morning. Let me pray for us as we begin. Father, we are grateful for yet another day to be together. Lord, we recognize this morning that your mercy is new again today. Thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, we come before you as those who are weak, those who are searching, those who are in need of reminder. And so, Lord, would you please meet us where we are this morning. Lord, we come to you as the God who has created the heavens and the earth and yet knows every intimate detail about us. Father, thank you for the great care that you took in creating us and putting us together. And Lord, thank you for the great care that you take in desiring to walk with us. Lord, we even look to Christ this morning who, who came as a man, fully God yet fully man. We spent all of December celebrating this in particular. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful picture of strength and humility. Lord, help us to walk more closely with Christ as a result of hearing from you this morning. It's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Would you continue standing this morning as we hear from the word of the Lord? Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ, who through he was in the form of God. Did not count equally with the God a thing to be grasped, but em <clears throat> emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father."
Let's pray. <clears throat> Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Wow. Lord, I was thinking, uh, w w the song we sang about your name, there's no name other than Jesus that would affect every person in this room. I don't know another name. There's no political name. There's no social name. There's no uh, 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 warlord name. There's no name that can affect every single person in this world but yours. So glory to your name. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God, who not only has a name that affects me, but can rescue me from sin and give me victory. Again, a great name, a name that affects everybody, but gives us power to be different and to walk in righteousness and in light and can be, and can be different and can be transformed 
and can be called children of God. And we sit here and we say, thank you, Jesus, for allowing me to have access to God the Father to be called his child and to be declared righteous. I deserve nothing, and I'm given everything. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And as your children, Lord, we come, and you say, come. Come bring me your requests. I'm your father. And so, faithful servants, Lord, what a great ministry. Oh, my goodness, Lord. They just, they minister to the sick and the poor, and, and, they, and they, they want to know what is next. And, Lord, I pray for wisdom and clarity for them, that you would guide them as you've guided them all along to extend Christ to a broken world in that community. I pray for, for knowledge of what you see for them, that the leaders of that uh, organization would know what to do next, Lord, to continue to promote your kingdom. Again, hallelujah to the Lamb. And I pray for Greg, um, a gentleman who has a church in Albania. He's here in the States. And he's here for comfort and encouragements. And Lord, thank you for the encouragement of the saints. Thank you that we're just not isolated in ourselves, but we're the body of Christ. And we actually can come to you for somebody else. So we come being rescued from our sin, covered in righteousness, having holiness and mercy and grace. We come and ask that you would help a church across the country, across the world, that they would know you too that this gospel is so powerful cannot be contained. Oh, Lord, help us to get on fire for Jesus Christ, for what he's done, and to care what he's doing in other countries. And so, Lord, take this offering that we give you, this tangible form of our love and worship, and I pray that you would bless it and send it to where it's needed. And I pray uh, uh, blessings over Pastor Jeff as he preaches the word of God, that it will not return void, that everyone in this room will hear the name of Jesus and will walk out of here different. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Will the officers come forward? could have imagined this infant and the infinite son of God so wonderful heaven's perfect miracle
could have imagined this infant and the infinite king of all so meek and mild God and sinner Well, good morning, church. It is great to see you, and I want to introduce somebody to you this morning that probably doesn't need much of an introduction around here. Uh, she is one who shines Christ's light so brightly in this place. But Tammy Pinchot? <laughs> you know, Tammy Tim- Pinchot. Pinchot. Okay, Pinshot. just want to make sure I got it right. I'm not um, related to Bronson. All right, I got gotcha. you. Well, well, hey, we... Some people are... don't even remember who he is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, I think he was before I was born, right? Oh, no, so anyway, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> that um, ages me. <laughs> well, we are here talking about rethinking sexuality and uh, have a conference this Saturday from 9 to 1230. And, and, and Tammy, you, you chose to take the J-term course. And, and could you tell us a little bit why you chose to take that course? Well, I chose to take the course because um, in my life, um, having interactions with friends and um, in my professional life, having interaction with my patients as a nurse in a hospital, um, I wanted to learn more how to interact and be more Christ-like in my interactions with others. All right. Well, what is something that has impacted you either in what you have read or, or in the class times? What's something that's, that's really stood out to you? Well, um, there's a lot. Um, but And my, my book is highlighted to the gills. Um, I highly, highly, highly recommend taking this course. Um, but one thing I learned this week that impacted me um, was Julie um, led us to the scripture of the two men praying. And um, one was a Pharisee and one was um, a tax collector. And the Pharisee, in his prayer, said, um, Oh, God, thank you that I'm not like him. And um, mm-hmm. I give, and I, <laughs> and I, and I. And, um, you know, sometimes as Christians, we fall into a comparison trap, and we think that somehow we're better than others. And ultimately, we are all level at the foot of the cross. And that really impacted me this week um, because, um, you know, I have sinned. We have all sinned. We are all human. And um, I need the cross just as much as anyone else does. And we shouldn't compare. So why do you think that Christians should be at the forefront of this conversation? Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing that Julie points out is that, um, you know, and it's so true in our homes. Do we really talk about this in our homes? Do we really talk about it in the church? And Julie is one of the forefront people. Um, She is a renowned Christian and biblical teacher, and she's a clinical psychologist. And um, so it's so important because if we aren't influenced by this, because this is a book to get us into this, um, if we aren't influenced by this and and, um, we are influenced 
outside these walls in our society. It is in our face, you know? And so it's so important that we as a church and we as a congregation really learn about and um, talk about it. And um, in Genesis it says, um, God created us and what he created was very good. So Awesome, awesome. Well, tell us why, if we can, why should everybody in this room be here this Saturday morning? Well, like I said, um, you know, I came into this thinking that I would get help to help others. <laughs> but what it has really done is convicted me. You know, every time you're in the word of God, it's a mirror into your heart. But um, I will tell you that one thing um, that Julie shares in her book is that we, we need to know what we believe, okay? And then we need to live what we believe. When I was growing up, my dad used to say, do what I say, don't do what I do. And I hated that. And um, I have tried very hard, and my daughter is here to testify, I try not to do that in my life. So I need to know what I believe, I need to live what I believe, and then I need to share what I believe. And um, one thing I want to say too is, and I haven't said it in any of the other services, is that, you know, society is in our face with this. Um, but we might think, you know, like I said with the Pharisee, that we have it all together. I'm, I've been married for 37 years, yay. Mm -hmm. Love, love, love my husband, but you know what? This class even helps me in my marriage. Mm -hmm today, being married for 37 years. So it's not just for, you know, um, singles. It's for everybody. Yeah. I don't care if you're 2 or 92. It's for everybody. Highly recommend the class. It's worth the 10 bucks. I would love to see this place filled. Julie's going to be here, um, and it's this Saturday from 9 to 1230. Awesome. You did my job for me. So um, you can... And there's uh, child care <laughs> provided. Uh, yes. <laughs> And you can register at riverwoodchapel.org. It's right on the front page there. But let's, have a pray let's pray together for the conference. Father, we are so thankful for the privilege we have, um, Lord, to, to really host this this weekend and, and to have Julie Slattery here. And Lord, be able to, uh, Lord, be educated in areas of our own lives, Lord, and new steps that we need to take in our own discipleship. Father, and, and more than anything, uh, we want to know more about this so that we can live rightly before you, so that we can better point others to you. And so, Lord, would you, uh, would you help us? Would you open our hearts to, to maybe take steps that we've never taken before? Um, but, Lord, to be able to live as Christ followers before this world and live, especially on this conversation, meekly and gently um, before, before our community. So, Father, we just want to tell you today how much we love you and praise you, and thank you for this privilege that we have. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tammy. All right, we are on Beatitude number three, and if you would, would you turn to your neighbor and say, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And now, will you turn to your neighbor and say, What in the world does that mean? I think we look at that word on the poster and say it's in way too bold of a type. It should be like, it should be, the, its font size should be like two. Um, and, and I think that's what we think of when we think of the word meek. And I mean, meek is not a word that we use every day as in, how's it going, man? Meek. You know, we just don't, we just don't hear that. It, it's abstract. It, it's hard to grasp. And yet Jesus says, this is the group who would inherit the earth. In other words, meekness is a condition of the heart of those who will inherit the earth. So if Jesus put this kind of weight behind the word, I think it's a good idea that we work diligently to make this word accessible. So of course, that means we're going to begin today with a top 10 list, all right? Moans and groans, all right. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm being typecast as the top 10 guy, but top 10 not meek list, all right? And let me, let me first make a couple of notes here before, before we go through this. First, I didn't want to use real people here because no matter who I used, I was going to make somebody angry. And so we chose to use actors, not real people, which actors are real people, but the characters they play kind of aren't. Um, 
And second, I'm a guy, so I'm drawn, drawn to movies with typically a strong uh, leading man. So we're going to focus more that direction. So, so that being said, here is the top 10 not meek list. Number 10, Marlon Brando in The Godfather. His jawline is way too pronounced to be meek, right? Number nine, Meryl Streep in The Devil Wears Prada. Uh, the scowl and the sunglasses won't let her be meek. Number eight, Sean Connery, Pierce Brosnan, Roger Moore, Daniel Craig, and some guy from the 70s I've never heard of in James Bond. <laughs> and let's just say if a tux were meekness, they'd be in. Number seven, John Wayne and all those westerns that happened before I was born. His hat was too big to be meek. Um, number six, Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible. I love the movies, but not meek. Number five, Matt Damon in the Jason Bourne series. He wants to be meek, but forgets how to do so. <laughs> See what I did there? All right, got it. Uh, Jennifer Lawrence as Katniss Everdeen. Why? I think I would like these movies a lot more if her name were Dogness rather than Katniss, but I don't know about you. In The Hunger Games, she is thrown and kind of forced into her post-apocalyptic not-meekness. Number three is Sly Stallone in Everything Sly Stallone Does, save maybe Rocky, and even in that movie, he likes to punch people. Um, number two is Bruce Willis in Die Hard, doesn't want to be meek and not meek. Uh, and number one, Dirty Harry, enough said. In fact, I thought about meek characters, and as I was thinking about meek characters in movies, really only four came to mind. Frodo and Sam Gamgee in, in The Lord of the Rings, and we'll, we'll make them one because they're both hobbits, all right? Um, I know that's discrimination against hobbits, but they're, they're characters, all right? Um, Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, Jimmy Stewart in It's a Wonderful Life, and virtually every character that Tom Hanks has ever played, except maybe Bill Bradley in The Post. But he was absolutely born to play Mr. Rogers and Forrest Gump and the reluctant captain in Saving Private Ryan. And I know I'm talking a lot about movies here, but I want us to get this. Our movies tell us that the meek don't inherit the earth. Really, our culture tells us the same thing. What is, so what does it mean to be meek? The, the original form of the word is, is from the Greek praus, which means gentle. And the word is used to describe things like taming wild animals or gentle medicine, a timely word, a nice breeze, and I just say yuck. You know, it's kind of like the word moist when I hear those yuck. <laughs> it also speaks to our ability to live with self-control. Aristotle called prous the middle ground between rage and the absence of anger. It has the strength to tame the wild, and yet it's under control. It's, it's power under control. The anonyms of, of, of meek are words like agitated, callous, cruel, disagreeable, excitable, harsh, hateful, irritable, loud, mean, merciless, rough, uncompassionate, violent, crude, Hey, all of those words describe Bruce Willis in Die Hard, and we love Die Hard, even though it's not a Christmas movie, all right? Yeah, it is, okay. I always get talk back from Jeremy in these things, so it's awesome. But let's get this straight. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is not cowardice, it's not spinelessness, and it's not for those who lack confidence. It's not an introverted personality type, and it is much more than being nice. It is impossible to translate the word with just one English word. It has this idea of a proper balance between anger and indifference, of a powerful personality properly controlled, of humility. The meek person was not passive, was not easily pushed around. The main idea of this word was strength under control, like a, a strong stallion that was trained to do a job instead of just running wild. The meek can be angry and yet not sin. They are meek before God in that they submit to his will and conform to his word. But they're also meek before men in that they are strong, yet also humble, gentle, patient, and long-suffering. 
A.W. Tozer said this, said it very well. The meek person is not a human mouse afflicted with a sense of his own inferiority. Rather, he may be in his moral life as bold as a lion and as strong as Samson. But he has stopped being fooled about himself. He's accepted God's estimate of his own life. He knows he is as weak and helpless as God declared him to be. But paradoxically, he knows at the same time that he is in the sight of God of more important than angels. In himself, nothing. In God, everything. My personal definition of meekness is a condition of the heart before God and man that seeks to restore everything that can possibly be restored. It means we live restorative lives in our families, in our relationships, restorative lives in our community, restorative lives in our churches. In what is increasingly becoming my favorite passage in all of Scripture, Jesus says this in Matthew 11. He says, come to me, all you who, are la- who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you know what the Greek word for gentle is there? It's praus. It's the same word that, that is used for meek in the third beatitude. Wait, wait, wait. Are you telling me that Jesus is describing himself here as meek? And if he is, that, that means that all those 1970s artists, you know, and I'm making, I'm ripping on the 1970s a lot today, but, but all those artists who painted Jesus with this long flowing blonde feathered hair and these feminine eyes were right, right? And yet I think it behooves us to take note of the character of Christ because that is the character of the kingdom and the one that is increasingly to be taking root in our own lives. In biblical times, a young ox was oaked to an older, experienced ox so that the older might train him in how to live and move and have its being. And so by bearing the same yoke, the ox would learn the proper pace and how to obey the direction of the master. You see, we learn by being yoked with Christ as we surrender our lives to him for direction. In one of the most important meetings in human history, one man sat on a throne representing the most powerful empire that the world had ever known. The other was a representative of a kingdom unlike any in the history of the world. One had all the makings of power, had all the accolades. He came from something and he had made more of a something out of himself. The other came from nothing, and to observers that day really looked weak, looked lower class and and helpless. One was a free man, the other was a prisoner. In this corner, representing the empire, was a governor named Pilate, and he was adorned with all the muscle and regalia that comes uh, with power and was announcing to the world, I am powerful, I am impressive. And in the corner of the kingdom was a carpenter named Jesus. Tell me if you would, if you were there that day, from your perspective, which one of these two men inherits the earth? But this was a paradox in every way, because the one that looked free was actually a prisoner, and the one that looked like a prisoner was actually free. The one who was an heir to an empire would fall. And the one who was from Nazareth, that nothing of a place, would inherit not only the earth, but the cosmos as well, both of which were created through him. But for those that had eyes to see and ears to hear, the carpenter from Nazareth was announcing a kingdom in which everything is reversed. Everything gets flipped upside down, or really better said, everything gets flipped right side up. The poor are rich. The last are first. In weakness, we are made strong. Death is a beginning. Losing is finding. The least become great. And serving is ruling. But we are in the audience of history, aren't we? And while we say we are in the corner of the man from Bethlehem, so often our actions testify to the thought that we think Pilate wins this bout. 
We might even say the egocentric, the proud, the upper class, the strong, the bullish, the brash, the entitled inherit the earth. It's just that Jesus' kingdom isn't like that. And honestly, we may not like it. Maybe you're here and you're saying, I've seen it. The meek don't inherit anything. That's not our world. But Jesus even predicted that that would be our response. He says they have eyes, but, but they can't perceive the kingdom. They have ears, but they don't hear it. They see Pilate as the representative of inheriting the earth, backed by an army, an empire, perception, and wealth. They say the pilots win on this earth. It's not the law of nature for carpenters from Bethlehem, born in a barn that smelled like a barn, to win in any culture. Ambition inherits the earth. The arrogant inherit the earth. The entitled inherit the earth. The aggressor inherits the earth. See, what Jesus is doing in the third beatitude is is, is really bringing fulfillment to David's writing in the 37th Psalm, which says this, Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. The writer here just keeps saying words like trust and commit and befriend, delight, be still, be patient, refrain. Those who wait will inherit the land. What? Those who refrain will inherit the earth. The meek shall inherit the land. But we believe a people of action will inherit the earth. Listen again to verse 5. It says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. I think a lot of us treat this life like Fred Flintstone's car. If it's going to move, I've got to make it move. If it's going to accelerate, it's on me. And we read Psalm 37. I think we have our own version uh, of this passage that goes something like this in the Americanized version. By all means, fret yourself because of evildoers. Envy the wrongdoers and those who get ahead. Trust in your own strength and ingenuity and make it happen. You don't have time to stop and delight in the Lord because you will miss out on the desires of your heart if you do. Commit your way to being a person of action. Trust yourself because you can't trust in anything or anyone else. Stop being still before the Lord because it's non-productive time. Fret yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices, and get even where you can. Get angry and take out your wrath. Those who make it happen shall inherit the land. The proud, the entitled, the doer shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Ouch. That's us, isn't it? Or at least that's me. I'll be the one to confess. And don't we get it? That's the message of Genesis 3 and 4 in a world broken by by sin and death. That's the world of Cain, not Abel. That's the world of Pilate, not Jesus. And Jesus is announcing a different kind of kingdom with these beatitudes, telling us the character of this kingdom is completely different. This kingdom is built on words like trust and refrain and wait. But we like to fret, or at least we do it. John Ortberg defines the world in which we live not just as hurried, 
but is experiencing and devastated by something called hurry sickness. What is hurry sickness? It's a behavior pattern characterized by continual rushing and anxiousness, an overwhelming continual sense of urgency. Let's take a test to see if we might be afflicted by this hurry sickness, all right? <clears throat> test number one. Do you begin to question the meaning of life when you accidentally choose and get stuck in the slow lane of traffic? Yes. Um, test number two. When you're in line A at Giant Eagle and you notice another person coming in behind you gets in line B and gets out of the store before you do, do you want to go all dirty hairy all over that person and say, go ahead, make my day? If you said yes to either of these, you may be experiencing hurry sickness, and I just defined me on a lot of days. I think it's the way of us. But this is what Jesus says, again, come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I love uh, Eugene per Peterson's paraphrase of this. Are you tired? Yes. Worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Listen to this, this sentence. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Do we ever stop? Does it ever dawn on us as we read this passage that the Lord of the universe says that I love you so much that I want to be yoked together with you in this? If we want to see our family's lives change, Jesus says, I want to be yoked together with you in that. If we have an addictive behavior that we can't overcome, Jesus says, I want to be yoked together with you in overcoming that. If we have an illness, emotional, physical, or otherwise, Jesus says, I want to be yoked together with you in this, no matter what it is. This is our Savior saying that to us. What he's really saying to us is this, I'm not disappointed with you. I'm not down on you. I love you and I am with you in this. Let's pull this load together. And while we do learn from me the unforced rhythms of grace and of life, Jesus, I want to fret. I want to make it happen. And he says, wait. And may I simply ask this. In this yoking, who do you think's doing the heavy lifting? You see, if, if, if your God is placing a heavy load on you, if he is constantly down on you, then you are not yoked to this God. You are yoked to the God of religion. You are not yoked to this Jesus. So question, why can't we just trust and commit, and befriend, and delight, and be still, and be patient, and refrain, and wait. Because this immeasurable God that we talk about every week is for us. And his son Jesus is yoked together with us, and his spirit is in us. I think, I think we perceive that the meek will miss out. That anything good or great has to be taken by force. And here he says that it is the meek that will inherit the earth, not the cutthroat, not the bullies, not the power brokers, not the 1% of all the people that Jesus said would inherit the earth on their radar and probably on ours. The meek aren't even on the list. In Philippians 2, Paul describes this Jesus with whom we are yoked. He says, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." 
Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus humbled himself not only to our humanity, but he was born in a barn in Bethlehem, not in a palace in Jerusalem. He was born the son of a carpenter, not the son of a king or, e- or even a governor. He washed feet, which was reserved not for the servants, but for their servants. And I think I've hyper-focused on the first part of that passage. You know, the emptied himself, humbled himself, obedient to death part. But there is another part of that passage. There is another part of meekness. You know the part that says, at his name, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Messiah. Catch this, Jesus is meek and the kingdom he's inaugurated is meek. But don't ever make the mistake of believing that there is even an ounce of weakness in him. My favorite football coach is a, is a guy who has a statue of himself about 20 miles from here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And, and if you were ever to meet Tony Dungy, he would be the last person on earth that you would expect to have two of the hardest hitting teams in NFL history. His demeanor is quiet. It's almost shy. He loves Christ. He never swore at his players. Doesn't get angry on the sidelines. And you think when you look at him, this guy is soft, but there's nothing soft about him. He was known for his hard-hitting defenses that often were rooted in a strong safety that could absolutely destroy you. He coached two of the hardest-hitting players in history. Two of those he coached were John Lynch, uh, who was up for the Hall of Fame this year, and the 2007 Defensive Player of the Year, Bob Sanders, who was basically a five foot seven inch bicep, kind of like myself. <laughs> and what I love about Dungy is his character, his demeanor. And he gives this incredible picture of the kingdom. And yet there's this incredible strength and fierceness to his will. And I don't idolize the man. You might question that if you walk in my office. But I think over a long period of time, he has given an incredible testimony of this aspect of the kingdom of God, that the meek will inherit the earth. I think a meek life is a lot like great art. There are artists who do pretty paintings, kind of two-dimensional flat caricatures that, that might draw us in for a season. But then there's the masters, the classics, the timeless whose art gains value in every passing generation. I think the meek life as defined in scripture is a lot like a classic work of art. Meekness differentiates the time bound from the timeless, the seasonal and temporary from the eternal. See, a life of Christ-like meekness is way too beautiful to just be pretty. Notice the progression of the first three Beatitudes. In the first, we recognize that we are absolutely spiritually bankrupt. And in that acknowledgement, the kingdom of, kingdom of heaven is open to us. In the second, we mourn, we grieve because of our spiritual condition and find comfort. But in the third, because we have realized our poverty and sin and we've properly grieved, we begin to be reshaped into the very word that so aptly describes the character of Christ. We are reconditioned from spiritually bankrupt and the artist picks up the brush and brings beauty out of our brokenness, brings eternity out of our smallness, turns our impoverished and grief-stricken condition into an inheritance that goes on forever and ever and ever. And Jesus says to us, this earth is yours for the taking, yours because you've been yoked together with me. I don't know about you, but I'm not looking for a soft Jesus with feathered hair and pristine features, like so many artists have portrayed him. I want a Jesus who is fierce like a lion, a lion who is for us, but I also want a Jesus who is a lamb that is with us. See, blessed are the meek, blessed are the fiercely gentle, 
those who lean in while waiting. Blessed are those who carry with them the character of the kingdom of God and the very character of Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me? And can I just ask you to, uh, to meet with the Spirit of God right now and, and just allow him to question you in these moments? Where are you taking action in your life where you need to just trust? Where are you trying to kick the door down And his word for you today is wait. Where in your life has anger turned into rage? And you need him to whisper to you about that patience that's available to us. Can I pray a prayer blessing over you? God, would you give us eyes to see? and ears to hear the words of your kingdom, not our empire. Where we are fretting, teach us to trust. Where we are running, would you teach us to commit? Where we are competing, teach us to befriend. Where we are agonizing, teach us to delight. Where we are anxious, teach us to be still. Where we are angry, teach us patience. Where we want to make it happen, teach us to refrain. Where we are sickened by hurry, teach us to wait. And give us eyes to see that you are yoked together with us in this, with a gentle and meek yoke. Give us a perspective of a kingdom where the meek inherit the earth. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Church, as we take time now to respond to what we just heard, I want to call our attention and remind us of Isaiah 53, where Scripture speaks of, writes of, tells of the suffering servant, one who would at him, there'd be no majesty about him, there'd be really not much to look at. And yet we know that ultimately that finds, that, that, that prophecy finds its fulfillment in Christ as he would head to the cross. And what's beautiful about that passage of scripture in Isaiah 53 is that this is a description not of weakness, but of meekness. For Christ was still who he said he was still entirely God he had come in the flesh as man and so even as we consider what we just heard as you spend time worshiping and responding to the word of the Lord consider these things about Christ as we sing if you'd like to pray with someone there'll be members of our prayer team in the back who would love to join you in that
amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Christ is risen.
that King of Kings that we just sang about comes to us in meekness. The character of the kingdom that he inaugurated is meek, but there is great power in meekness. Remember this weekend, this Saturday, as Rethinking Sexuality, and we invite everybody that can to be there. It's going to be a great day together. Let's say our benediction together. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Go and pursue Jesus this week. God bless you.